we will be talking about the Indo Greeks. Um, um, since it is mainly numismatics, I will go a little slowly. Um, I'll be very happy to answer the questions because sometimes um, when people talk about guns, people get really frightened, thinking that it's a very difficult subject. It is difficult, but it's fascinating, and especially when it concerns the early part of Indian history. So we are, when I say Indo Greeks, it is they are the that is the history of the Greek kings who ruled in uh, Afghanistan and today's Pakistan, meaning ancient India. Um, after the Alexander the Great's invasion, as we know, Alexander reached India. Um, when I say India, I mean today's Pakistan. Um, uh, between 329 and 2026. 20, and after his death on the 10th of June, 323, um, some of the regions conquered by Alexander were reconquered by Chandragupta Maitreya. And the northern part in Bactria, it's, it, they were still in the Seleucid Empire and also the Bactrians. And later, after the decline of the Mauryan Empire, after Ashoka, the Greeks crossed the Hindukush mountain and came to the territories of India. So this is the story of these kings. Um, as you can see here, it starts somewhere around 250 BC with the revolt of Diatetus, who revolted against the uh, Seleucid Empire and became an independent ruler. So with him, we call the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. So uh, I mean, it continued until um, um, for a long time until Heliocles the first. As I said, after the uh, decline of the Mauryan Empire, um, with um, uh, Demetrius and Agathocles, these Greek kings came to the southern part of the Indukush mountain, and they lived there, showing bilingual coins. We call them Indo Greeks. So I'll be covering this part, and next week. I'll be covering the rest, meaning Indo Scythians, Indo Parthians, and the Kushans. So, when we talk about coins, I just give you a sample without even commenting on them, a uh, number of coins that you can see uh, struck by these Greek kings. Um, why is it important to um, uh, know numismatics? So, history of coins to write the history of the um, nomadic, I mean, Indo Greeks and the nomadic su su successors like Scythians, Parthians, and Kushans. The problem is the ancient texts dealing with the early history of these kingdoms are very rare. From Indian side, we have no help at all, apart from the Milindapanya, which is, I mean, the original work is lost. So we have the Pali uh, version found in Sri Lanka and the two translations in Chinese. We are left with short passages from a few Greek and Latin authors and some Indian, what I said, was really the Panya and Chinese texts. So Greek and Latin historians were not interested in the destiny of the Greeks in Bactria and India and the names of local authorities are mentioned only when they have direct or indirect connection with the Seleucids or the Parthians. So there is no history written in Greek or Latin about the Bactrian kingdom or the Indo-Greek kingdom. Those kings are mentioned only when they talk about the Seleucid Empire or the conquest of Seleucus or others. On the other hand, the Chinese annals give us some important information about the Kushans. So how to write this history? As I told you, after the Alexander's death, uh, on 323 BC, the area that I have uh, highlighted in yellow color uh, came under the uh, Chandragupta Maurya's empire, um, um, that the Maurya king, and the northern part of the Hindukush mountains remained under the uh, under the Greeks. So, starting first the Seleucids, and then after Diodotus, the Bactrian kingdom. Um, then afterwards, after the decline of the, um, uh, the Myrian kingdom after Ashoka, the Greeks could cross the Hindukush mountains and come to India. This is today's Pakistan or Gandhara area and also northern Gandhara and also some regions of uh, Afghanistan and also Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and, and, uh, and Uzbekistan. Then um, uh, Indo-Parthians and Indo-Scythians 
were ruling this some of these areas we will discuss this next week and then the kushan empire was found which is a huge empire almost as big as the mauryan empire although they didn't come to the orissa and other regions so that i'll discuss um, i will discuss next week um, first of all i have to tell you the uh, when we talk about the indo greeks we mean the ancient india um, of course the things have changed in 1947 so, uh, since the independence the in the i mean the country which is called pakistan was created then but when we talk when we uh, discuss this question uh, in the light of ancient texts for the greeks and um, uh, for, for the greeks even for the academics the region south of the indo kush mountain was considered as india and also the name derived from the indus river in this the hindu kush mountain played a huge role it is almost a natural frontier separating india from bactria what is in the north of hindu kush is considered as bactria what is in the south of the hindu kush mountains considered as india so it's a very long mountain chain um 800 kilometers long and also some of for example tirishmir it comes up to about 7788 meters which is very high so it was really a natural barrier separating this it is not only a rampart that separated india from bactria but also it was a language barrier the people who the people in the north of the indus spoke a different language than the indians i mean of course the earliest form is gandhari in the south of the indus mountains on a map so this is gandhara here we can see the himalayan range and here we have the indus range so anything north is bactria anything south is considered india so uh, here we have the uh, highest mountain in the indus region and these are some of the mountains of the region um we i took this photograph in 2002 when on my way to bamiyan after the destruction of the bamiyan buddha so, so you can see it is almost like a rampart like a natural fortification so people were protected uh, from this rampart and here again you can see very high mountains and it's very difficult to climb them um and to go to the other places unless you take the take a pass so the basic geographic character is sticks of these two large zones help us to help us in understanding the settlement patterns of the various kingdoms in these regions bactria and sogdiana are dominated by the mountain regions of the pamir and hindu kush which are constantly covered in snow they are characterized like most region in central asia by impressive mountains high plateaus large deserts and narrow valleys where human settlements tend to be concentrated to exploit the few fertile strips of cultivable land so if, this is a good picture where you can see the mountains almost barren i mean not almost really barren uh, nothing will grow here but uh, in the with, if there is a river or a stream the people can cultivate but these are very narrow strips of land like here you can see so the mountains are barren and the valleys are rich because thanks to the um, uh, thanks to the rivers and also the irrigation system uh, the bactria had from the uh, from the bronze age especially and also from the kemenic period so here is a good uh, good photograph um, on the way to bamiyan where you can see the barren mountains and the natural well I mean, fertile valleys in southeast afghanistan and northwest india by the slopes of the hindu kush and the himalayas the very narrow but extremely fertile valleys of hunsa chitral and especially swat offered ideal locations for human settlements unlike the regions to the north the areas to the south of hindu kush are characterized by the large basins and broad plains of banu and peshawar and by the presence of rivers like the indus and the swat which is a tributary of the indus river the great plains of punjab the country of five rivers are the richest of all the regions of pakistan even in ancient days it is much richer than the gangetic valley um so here is the photograph i took 
when I went to Bamiyan just after the destruction of the Buddha in 2002. You can see the, the, the mountain range is barren, but below people can, people grow potatoes and it's quite rich. And also Begram, which was a city at Alexandria of Caucasus, founded by Alexander around 327 BC. I will come to that. Uh, just to give you an idea about the uh, about Kabul, this is the capital. You can always see the smelting snow, and thanks to the smelting snow, the, they are able to cultivate the land. Um, uh, this is the picture I took when I went to meet Sak. I'll tell about it more. So the 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 plain is covered by the uh, by the snow, and just during the spring. When the snow starts smelting, the people can start cultivating the land. And just to give you an idea, I took these photographs in 2005 when I went to Afghanistan. Uh, these are uh, lorries coming from Lahore, I'm sorry, from Peshawar, carrying woods to Kabul, and you can see the condition of the roads. And just when you look on the other side, this is what you see of the area. It's extremely beautiful. And of course, we all know about the Khyber Pass, which give access from Afghanistan to Pakistan, today's Pakistan. And when you come to the valleys like Hunza, and these are the slopes of the Hindu Kush mountains. So of course, the river is Indus, so it is very fertile and people have plenty of water, sometimes even without any irrigation. I mean, they don't have irrigation tanks, but they can have irrigation canals. Um, here again, the upper portion of the Indus River in Pakistan, and you can see how fertile it is. Uh, the water is almost blue color because of the smelting snow. Again, uh, this is the upper part of the Swat River, which is a tributary of the Indus, and you can see this blue color uh, of the water. And then Swat is a very rich valley, um, uh, you can see from here. And uh, these are the fertile lands that people have their, you know, cutlery and don't know also they do cultivation here. And this site is extremely important. It's a Greek site, Indo Greek site, still unexcavated. Apart from illicit diggings that people have found coins and other things, still is there waiting for the, uh, the uh, any archaeological mission to do some work. So we come down towards the uh, middle of the uh, not the upper middle of the Indus River. Um, the photograph is taken from the bridge of Atok, where you can see the Indus coming from Himalayas with the blue color water. And this is on the right hand side, uh, on our left hand side is the Kabul River. Uh, I mean, crossing uh, Kabul and also Peshawar with a lot of dust and clay, and it is brownish color. So this is the place where um, Indus meets uh, Kabul River. And of course, we know Jehelum, and this is one of the five rivers, I mean, five rivers of Punjab, one of the tributaries of the Indus. So the, the region south of the Hindu Kush mountain is, it was and is extremely rich and good for cultivation. So people who came there, whether they were Greeks or Scythians or Parthians or Kushans or later Timurids, they all settled down there because, I mean, the climate is wonderful. And also you have so many rivers and also it's a blessing for cultivation. So when we write about the history of the Greeks, so even the Scythians and Parthians, what are the archaeological evidence we have to write the history? That's one of the ways of, I mean, we, we speak archaeologically. Um, um, so what do we know about the presence of Hindu Greeks? Now, for example, people, people talk about Taxila, especially Sitka, because it was not really excavated. Bir Mound was the, uh, the Achaemenid, the Persian, under Persian Empire, perhaps a place where Alexander reached, and that time Sitka was not found. Um, and Sitka was found most probably by Menander. But the excavations done by John Marshall, they don't go down the, to the Indo Greek. So, what we see here, the beautiful site. This is all Sido Parthian or Scythian and Parthian site. Um, the Greek levels were much below. So the British archaeologists didn't want to destroy these structures. He kept the structures, but the real Greek city is below, as you can see here. So we know hardly anything about the Greek presence uh, in Sirka, apart from the reminiscence of the early Greek uh, tradition 
meaning uh, some um, some terracotta, some coins and sculptures. So it is not very encouraging. And also Pushkalavati, which was the main capital later of the Kushans, it was excavated by Olchin and then recently by Robin Cunningham. But the results are extremely poor because it's very difficult to excavate such a site because of the mud brick constructions. They, uh, in this place, there are very few baked bricks or the stone sculptures. So the difficulty, I mean, if you are archaeologist, you will understand it's very difficult to excavate them. And also other main difficulties, um, there were so many other structures after, that means Sidian, Parthian, Kushans, and also Hindushai, and also later Timurid. So these sites are extreme. You can see how dig um, the, the depth of the, uh, the, the sondage or the, uh, or the dig. So you have to go very down. So the results were not very encouraging. Same thing for Bactra, if you go to um, Afghanistan, we all know that Bactra was the capital um, of Bactria. Uh, so when Alfred Fouché went there with a lot of hopes, he's the famous Alfred Fouché, uh, who is the father of Gandharanath. And when he went uh, in the uh, end of the 19th century, he was looking for a Greek city like the one that he has seen in uh, Athens or there for other places. But his disappointment was enormous. He was digging with under very, very difficult uh, situation with his young uh, wife and also malaria and all the things. But you can see how deep he went. And he didn't, he didn't find this Greek settlement that he was looking for. So I just translate into English what he wrote in French. Um, so this is what he says, Bactra, meaning the capital of Bactria, bears a name that is so strongly evocative, so charged with history, so crowned with hopes that we refuse to admit the possibility of a disappointment, even at the moment we are feeling it. The distance between the universal and uncontested prestige which this site enjoys in European imagination and the humbleness of local realities are such that it is impossible not to ask who has made the mistake here. Add to this, the fact that nothing is more disconcerting in this place than the contrast between the magnitude of the piles of ruins and the meanness of the material of which these immense mounds seem to be composed. And you will understand that like a hesitant traveler faced with the dis uh, dissipating mirage, not knowing exactly where the reality begins and where the illusion ends. I have came to doubt the testimony of my eyes and to repent my assessment as soon as I write them. So this is the conclusion of Fouché. And he concluded that there was no Greek side there. But um, after the, um, uh, when the American army came in and when the Afghanistan was once open, uh, the French archaeological delegation was recreated and they went to Masar Sharif, Bactra, and they started excavating the site. And they almost reached the Greek sites. Not that there was no Greek site, but you have to go very, very down to find the Greek settlements. Even the ones they found, this was the end, tail end of the Greek settlements, not the heart of the Greek settlements. About 3,000 coins were found, Corinthian capitals were found like here. But unfortunately, because of the instability of Afghanistan politically, uh, the French archaeologists gave up the excavation and came back to France. So we still don't know what is there hiding or hidden in Bactra, the capital of Bactria. Same disappointment was there when the British archaeologists went to Alexandria, um, uh, which is Kandahar today. It is Alexandria of Caucasus, founded by Alexander during his conquest. So you can see the old black and white photograph. These are mounds and mounds, and this is not even a natural mound. Uh, this is an artificial mound of settlement. So there are so many settlements over the Greek settlements, not only Scythian, Parthian, Kushans, but also for the later ones like, uh, like Hindushai and Timurids. So the Greek, uh, sorry, British archaeologists were excavated in there like McNichol and Warwick Ball. And in their conclusion, this is what they write. At Kandahar, 
the scarcity of traces of Hellenistic constructions led the excavators to ask themselves whether classical authors were not mistaken when they spoke of Greek colonies settled in the city. So this is what they felt. They didn't find the Greek settlements. Not that there are no Greek settlements, but they don't go down enough uh, to find them. Now, of course, today you can't go to Kandahar, you can't excavate there because of the present um, uh, political and um, stability. If you go to Uzbekistan, for example, Termes on the other side of the Oxus River, here is the Oxus River, uh, um, uh, with Pichikin um, um, uh, uh, here. Um, and I, here is the site, um, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, not Pichikin, Shakir Pidayev. Uh, the archaeologist who is working for the Uzbek Institute, and these are the, this is the rampart. When he started going down, he had to go nearly 12 meters below the ground level to find the Greek levels. He found them. But the sondage, the dig was so small, he couldn't get a complete idea of the Greek settlements there. He found coins, he found a lot of terracotta objects and sculptures, but the because such an excavation cost a lot of money, so he didn't continue, um, but he was more interested in the later Kushan period. For example, my colleagues of the Economal Superior, Franz Cronia and others, they have been working in Samarkand, in Marakanda, which was a place where Alexander came. Um, and they were, they were also disappointed because they didn't find any Greek settlements because it's very difficult, especially in Central Asia, they hardly used any um, baked bricks. They used only um, uh, unbaked bricks, so it's very difficult to find anything there. So they went down and couldn't, still couldn't find the Greek settlements. So uh, this is to tell you we have little, little evidence uh, from the archaeological point, point of view to write the history of the Greeks apart from Icanum, which is a city um, excavated by the Greek archaeological mission under Paul Bernard, who was my dear teacher, who passed away about three years ago. Here is Paul Bernard with the former Japanese emperor when he was a prince um, between 1964 and 78. It, the reason why it was so important is that it's, it is very well situated. As you can see here, um, it is uh, in the, um, so the uh, northern Afghanistan, which is being excavated by the French agricultural delegation in Afghanistan, located on the eastern edge of the Bactrian Plain at the confluence of the Oxus and a tributary of its left bank, the Kocha. The city of Aikanum controlled an agricultural land area irrigated by a vast system of canals, occupying a triangular site 1.8 kilometers long the defenses of which have been reinforced by a belt of powerful ramparts. The urban agglomeration comprised an upper city made of a hill uh, playing the role of an acropolis on which two citadels were built, a lower city between the latter and the two rivers where most of the buildings were located as well as shrub outside the wall. So this is the site. Um, um, site. You can see the Kokcha River and the Oxus. And here is Afghanistan. This is Tajikistan. And other important thing about Iconum is after the Greeks, there were very few settlements. A uh, city was destroyed. So the French, French archaeologists came here, as I call it, but they didn't call it, but I call it a virgin site. It's almost like an intact, a Greek site that they found. Uh, as not as like um, like Pushkalavati or Samarkand or uh, um, or uh, the the site like Alexandria of Caucasus um, or Alexandria of um, of Kandahar, um, Arakosia. So this was a wonderful site. Um, this is uh, uh, this is a photograph taken um, uh, during the excavations. They found a wonderful site. So the French archaeologists were not in a hurry. They took their time to do the excavations. They did it well. But, you know, as you know, in 77, 78, the Soviet army invaded Afghanistan. The French archaeologists, they had to leave the country and come back. So um, this, is, uh, this is how the city looked like. Uh, this program was done by my laboratory with the architect and also the uh, former delegation, the members of the delegation like Paul Bernard, Franz Crony, uh, Pierre Lerich, uh, Andre Paul Frankfurt, Claude Rapin, who worked there, and the Japanese television channel NHK. 
So these things were done by NHK. I'm very grateful to them. So it gives you an idea how the city looked like. So it had a huge Greco-Bactrian architecture, that is a palace, um, uh, reminiscent of the formal Persian palatial architecture was in the center of the lower city. So it's a mixture of Greek and Persian architecture, and it had the third or three orders. So Doric, um, um, uh, Corinthian, and Ionic, and mostly the Corinthian capitals you can see here. It was a huge palace. And this is how it would have looked like we got in the reconstruction of this big palace in Aikano. Um, I'm, I'm sure in Bactra, if they do the excavation, they will find even a bigger city because it was the capital of uh, Bactria. And there was a gymnasium. As you know, it's a school and also for gymnastic. Um, so it's 100 by 100 meters. Um, and you can see so by the side of the river with a huge open courtyard. And these are the rooms for teaching learning and other, uh, other practices. So, so wonderful um, architecture of the gymnasium. And also they had um, private houses inside the city walls. And these private houses look like this. So very comfortable houses according to a Greek plan. And then they had a theater. It's a classical theater with 35 rows and seats could sit four to 6,000 people. So we are talking about something happening in second century BCE. It is only secondary to the Epidauros in, a Greek, in the Greek world. And even this was bigger than the one in Babylon. So it's a big, big theater looking at Doxus River with the stage um, 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 in the city. So you can see the um, excavations during the excavation. They couldn't finish the excavation, but it, it gave a good idea. And also it had a temple of Zoroastrian model uh, in the temple, but there was a statue. Um, some say it's Zeus, some say it's Mitra. Um, it's a controversy, but, but it's but not the architect, I mean, the iconography and that style is really Greek. And it had this, um, um, the foot and some fingers. It's a part of an acrolytic image. Acrolytic means instead of making the statue of wood, or stone or marble, you make a huge, a huge statue like in Parthenon in Athens, um, in wood, and only the external parts are of marble. So like here, the foot, so the wooden structure should come over here. And then the, the, st the statue was covered by clothes. So this is a very, I mean, archaic way of making sculptures in the Greek world. So it was there. And these are some of the sculptures found by the uh, the uh, uh, French archaeologists during the excavations, and also the, this, these two, two sculptures were found in the fountain, um, and the water came from there. It shows that, you know, in the Greek theater, they, the, the people didn't appear in their own physical form, but they wore masses, and also the importance of Heracles in the gymnasium. Um, what happened was when the Soviet army invaded, the, uh, the French archaeologists left Afghanistan. Um, and then after the Soviet army left Afghanistan, the, the, the people started digging the Ikanu. And this is a photograph taken how this place was illicitly destroyed by the illicit diggers. As a result, many things were found. You can see the holes dug up. This is not done by the French archaeologists, but this is done by the people who were looking for the uh, treasures. Um, and they removed all these uh, Corinthian capitals uh, and the columns. Since they have no idea that this should be up and this should be down, they put the capital down and the base on the top. And this is a Chaihane, a, a tea shop, where uh, Masud was killed. Uh, so they removed most of them. And then these are some of the uh, artifacts found by the illicit diggers, which came to the Peshawar Bazaar, which where I photographed them. And also this huge statue of Athena, which I, um, um, which I didn't see personally. Others, these things I saw, this I didn't see, but someone gave me the photographs. It is one of the biggest statues ever made of Athena, and it's an acrolytic image. And also they had gold, and there were a lot of gold coins, and these are gold ingots. Recently, on the Oxus River, even these photographs were given to me by my good friend, Honorable Frankfurt. He took these photographs in the Oxus River 
people are looking for a river gold. So you can see it is a very primitive technique of finding gold. So gold was there. That this is coming from Badakhshan, and they had enough gold. So this is how even in 1960s and 70s, people of this area close to Aikano, they were looking for gold. And then there's another important excavation. It is not very important for the Indubic period, uh, but for the Indusidian period, uh, which is the Begram, Alexandria of Caucasus. Uh, what you see here is the rampart of the Kushan period. And this is the Greek city. Uh, this was a Soviet military camp when I went there. Um, in 2002, the Soviet army was no more there, only the camp remained, and this was the old city of, uh, founded by, um, by Alexander the Great, and this is the Panchi River. Um, so Alex, the background was very important, it was the center of many routes. One is coming from Egypt, uh, in, from the Indus River, and then one is going to Alexandria, uh, Koke, Arakosia, Kandahar, and then to the Parthian world. And this one was going to the Silk Road, these two, through Aikanum Kashgar Silk Road. And then you have the other one connecting uh, uh, Yamuna and then Ganges going up to Calcutta. So it was a center. As a result, so here is a aerial view, Panchi River here. And this is a city founded by Alexander. And this is the city founded by Kanishka, uh, the, uh, the, um, the Kushan, uh, Kushan city. So you have the city founded by Alexander in 327 uh, BCE. And these are the walls of, of the Kushan Empire. And they are the French archaeologists of the French archaeological delegation. Joseph Hakan and his wife, uh, Ria Hakan, were excavating uh, just before the Second World War, at the beginning of the Second World War in 1937. Uh, they found in room number 10 and 13 a huge treasure which is very important for us. I'll be talking about it again when I talk about the Indusidians. These are mainly imports from Alexandria. This is Harpokatris, I mean, half Greek, half Egyptian god. And these are emblemata, and these are painted glass from Alexandria. These are ivories from India. So it was a really a trade center. And uh, things from Alexandria came through the Red Sea and the Indus River. And these are the river goddesses. Uh, certainly would have come from uh, Maharashtra, uh, Indian ivory. And then you have uh, the painted glass where you have the combat between Achilles and Hector and uh, you, uh, the, the fight. And um, uh, here is uh, Hector, uh, Achille, uh, uh, Hector. And this is the place where Achilles dragged in the dead body of Hector uh, before his father during the Trojan War and also statues like Serapis, uh, which is very important. So it shows there was a Greek culture and also the other objects were coming from, uh, from Alexandria of Egypt. Um, so it's, it's a combination of Osiris. Um, um, and this, this happened uh, during the time of uh, Ptolemy I, one of, the, um, uh, one of the successors of Alexander the Great in Egypt. So you can see Serapis where in the Kalatos. Kalatos is this holding the club. So he looks almost like Heracles, but he is not Heracles, but Serapis. And also the, these um, uh, um, the, we call them medallion or emblemata or plaster cars um, of that period. They were not for sale, but these things were there in the shops. Uh, if, if you want to make a silverware with this motif. So you would come to the silversmith and say, I want this with the nice vase for my wife uh, or for my, uh, for my husband uh, with this motif on it. So here we have the, uh, the Ganymede. You have heard about this in the Greek mythology, Ganymede, uh, the um, Ganymedes um, is a divine hero whose homeland was Troy. Ganymede was the most attractive among mortals by reason of which he was ab uh, abducted by Zeus, the supreme god, in the form of an eagle to serve as a cup bearer to the gods and the Zeus beloved. As you know, in the Greek uh, society, homosexuality and heterosexuality were common practices. So Zeus sometimes uh, abducted uh, Europa, who is a woman, uh, sometimes this young boy, and by taking the form of an eagle. So it is there. 
and also another um, uh, another medallion uh, with the story of Endymion, so eternal uh, eternal sleep. So Endymion was uh, loved by Selene, the moon goddess, um, who visited him every night while he lay asleep in a cave in uh, Mount Latmus in Caria. She bore him fifty daughters. Um, uh, so a common form of the myth represents. Endomedian as having been put to sleep by Selene herself so that she might not enjoy um, uh, his beauty undisturbed. So that means you put the hero in a sleep so he won't get old. So every day night he used to come and make love and became pregnant and then bore 50 children. So this is another Greek story and it was, this was found in background in Afghanistan. So apart from archaeological evidence, we are now looking for epigraphy. Fortunately for us, during the last 20 years, a lot of new inscriptions were found. And also uh, these are some of the inscriptions found um, uh, in recent years. All of them were found during the last 20 years. I am not going to discuss all of them, at least some. But this was found during the excavations done by the French before the invasion of the Soviet army. Uh, that means before 1977 or 78. And it is it was found in the gymnasium. Um, I'm not going to read the uh, Greek, but this is the translation by Paul Bernard. As children learn good manners, as young men learn to control the passions, in the middle age be just, in old age give good advice, then die without regret. And this part which is which I am doing now. Um, uh, so the other part is that there were so many other inscriptions. This cup of agate was found. It had the legend Basilios Soteros Menandro. And if you turn it, and it has the lane, we can see, um, uh, uh, we can read it very clearly. Um, uh, Androkeles Epoyei. Epoyei means he made it. So this person made this cup. So it's quite interesting. It reminded me of this um, uh, bracelet, uh, which I published with my Guruji, Paul Bernard, which had an inscription. And here it says, Mestor Repoye. That means Mestor, he's the craftsman, he made it. So this is quite interesting. If I interest, this is an article I published um, in French, but it is now translated into that I will come later. And this inscription was found in Pakistan, which was studied by Richard Solomon and it's written in Gandhari, is one of the most important inscriptions ever found. Uh, it was uh, found here in Bajor. And this inscription bears a triple date, referring to the eighth day of the Sharvana in the regnal year of 27 of Vijayamitra, uh, the year uh, 73 of the year which called Assess, and the year 201 of, uh, of, one of the Greek. So we have a reference to Asis era, a Greek era. So according to Solomon, since the Asis era is apparently the same as the modern Vikram era, the date of the inscription could, could, would correspond up to approximately of uh, 15 CE. The uh, uh, collocation of dates enables him to pinpoint the year of the Greeks as 186. So the Greek era, he dated 286 and 85, and this is the, uh, the article by Richard Solomon, which I edited, uh, which is published, um, uh, published in, by Brepos in Turnout. Recently, Halifax and uh, Chris Bennett revisited in the light of many inscriptions um, the Vikram era and came to the conclusion that Asis era is to be dated in the year 448, not 58. So the year 201 of the Greeks or the Yona era mentioned in the Bajor inscription published by Solomon must be placed in the year 176, giving us some precious indication on how to place uh, in a chronological order some of the Greek, Parthian, Scythian and Kushan kings who reigned in the India and allowing us to establish the uh, accession of Anishkanishka the first on the throne and the beginning of the Gandharan art about 127 CE. So this inscription and the interpretation of Falk, who with whom I totally agree, making the Greek year 176 and BCE and the uh, and the RCC era 48 
solve many problems. So they give us some um, historical low, um, uh, um, historical placement for the kingdoms. So if you are interested, this was uh, published in Acta Orientale by Chris Bennett and Harry Falk. And then in Yusuf Dara in Afghanistan, a parchment was found and it was published by Vedi Claris and Dorothy Thompson. And it uh, very clearly referred to a, um, uh, uh, to a, I mean, uh, th I mean, it is 30 years uh, from Antimachus, the Antiochus II, 206. So in this, uh, uh, I mean, if this inscription and the deduction, again, I agree, uh, I agree with uh, uh, Clarice and uh, Thompson, uh, to see true Antimachus succession to the Bactrian throne must be placed in the year 176. So we get a very clear chronological order of the beginning of the Greek era. So according to my colleague, some colleagues, it is Antimachus who founded the Greek era. And I believe it is Agathocles that which I am writing in the next book uh, to show that it should be Agathocles who founded the Greek era. It doesn't matter really. Um, and you should not be worried if people disagree because we have very little evidence to write this history. So everyone is advancing hypothesis. Everyone is trying to come to the closest of the, uh, the absolute chronology. Nobody has come. So we all can do is uh, propose a relative chronology. So, so don't get upset when you see somebody contradicting me or contradicting someone else. It is almost like a game of the historians because we can't tally everything together. So as for the numismatic evidence, it is thanks to the coins that we know today, the existence of 45 Greek kings who ruled in Bactria and India, although the written sources mention only eight. This is something that we have, we have to bear in mind. If we study the history of Alexander's successors in India, you cannot entirely rely on, um, on literary sources. So they only mention eight kings. But if you read the names of the kings written on the obverse or the reverse of the coins, they mention 45. So this is the reason why we call the history of Hindu Greeks and Hindu Siddhan and Hindu Parthians in India and Central Asia is basically numismatic. Without coins, you can't write this history because in India, we don't have a chronicle for this period. So it is very important to bear this in mind. So the coins are crucial in understanding the role of these kings. So how do we, how do we analyze coins? One is the stylistic feature, features, suggest broad chronological periods, overstrikes, because I will tell you what it is, of one king on the coins of another indicate the succession of reigns, the minting techniques, metrology, iconography, monograms associated with fine spot aid evolution, uh, evaluation of the uh, geographical localization of different kingdoms. So you see, uh, when I say this, we cannot propose an absolute chronology or absolute locality for each king or each kingdom. So we try to come to the, come closest to the reality or the absolute chronology. So there are so many different views about uh, the history. So it's left to you to uh, select and you have to read books and see who is given, who has given the better arguments for the history of these people, uh, these kingdoms. So when I talk about coin hoards, why they are very important. When we take a coin hoard, um, there are two ways. You know, these are the banks of those days because you can deposit your uh, money in a bank. So what you do is you put them in a pot. So uh, somebody can start putting the coins in a pot and ask the son or the daughter to continue. And that son can ask the, his children to continue. But this is quite rare because at what point someone is going to take the pot out and take the money. The other explanation is it was done during the, uh, I mean, lifetime of that means 30 to 40 years or even five years or even one year. So you take the coins in your position and you put them in a pot and you bury them in your house. You die without giving the, a single hint and it is buried. Or um, sometimes because of the, uh, I mean, the, the water structure, the, the coin hoards have, can be transported 
even underground. So you don't find the hoard in the same place. So fortunately, we can find them. So I'm just giving you, I mean, I spent about 10, 10 to 15 years residing in Afghanistan and Pakistan, looking for these hoards. This is how we find them. Pots in pots sometimes here, the coins, and even here, and they are all stuck together. So you have to be very careful by cleaning them. And um, this sword, for example, which I had access completely, there were 800 Hindu Greek coins. You can see the number of uh, coins that have come to light. So, so when you look at the coin hoard, it gives you a close geographical um, um, uh, location and also very tight chronological frame. So if the coins are, I mean, if you look at the rulers who are, or the kings who are represented in the hoard, so we can say these coins, these kings rule in a closed framework. So it's a way of, uh, I mean, solving the problem of succession of the kings and also the locality where they ruled. I mean, you will say that the silver and the, and the gold I mean, traveled, for example, there were a lot of coins of Antiochus II and Diodotus found in Vaishali in India. It doesn't mean that Diodotus ruled there, but they traveled because for the trade. And also same thing with the Roman coins found in South India. They were, they were transported or taken to India for the bullion value, for the gold value, and to buy spices and gemstones and other things. But if you have a tight thought like that, you, are, you don't really run into confusion because they were um, they were hoarded in a close period and this one this um, i went there i mean if you believe it or not this is meet um, in the disguise of a pakistani um, this place it's quite interesting i heard when i was in lahore not in lahore in islamabad that they found a hoard that they um, the people were using a bulldozer uh, to flat this land by the side of a tributary of the indus and the bulldozer hit a jar with, um, filled with coins. So people around the place, they, they, I mean, they fought for it and they took the coins. And most of the coins came to, uh, came to Islamabad and then Islamabad to Peshawar. So I was going, it is called, place is called Sarai Saleh. So every time I heard there was a vote found, I went to the place and did my inquiries. And this is the time that I went there. And then again here, I'm not going to show you all the hopes that I have found or that I, I found where, where the places where the hopes were found, where I went. For example, this poor peasant here, um, he found two hopes, one in 1990, which contained four, four to 400 Hindu Greek coins. They were bought by a dealer and they were sold to the international market. So the first one went to Japan. So I, I took these photographs. Here is the man who found it. And here is my guide. This is the place the first toad was found. And this is 1993, the same person. You can see the way he's dressed, he's still poor. The hoard was sold for more than those days for $150,000. And the poor man got only $300. So there were 300 coins in it. And then again, a very important hoard, Barikot hoard, uh, which had 445 uh, um, um, uh, coins, uh, so 231 Hindu Greek and 214 Panchma coins, uh, which I published recently. I'll show you the book with my colleague from Calcutta, Sushmita Bashuma Dundar. It's very important because it has both Hindu Greeks and the Maidan series. And then this hoard, which contained 20 kilograms, the person who found it tried to clean it and all the coins were diluted in the chemical bath, so it became a soap. So not a single coin was saved. And this hoard is still um, was found in Afghanistan, and it is in a private collection in San Francisco. The, the collector wants to keep it intact like this, so they are all of such omegas. You may, may have heard about the work I did in uh, Mirsaka, which had um, which is the largest uh, um, Greek hoard ever deposit ever found. Um, I was in um, Islamabad when I heard in 1994, somebody told me that a hoard was found in Mitsaka. I knew what Mitsaka was. In a well in 1942, uh, French archaeologists intervened and they found 30,000 coins. And here, three and a half tons of coins. That means 3,500 kilograms of coins were found there. When I heard the news, I didn't believe. And here you can see 
in front of, I'm sorry for showing my photographs, but these are the only photographs I have because I couldn't take the photographs and those days we were using film rolls. Uh, so my friend was taking the photographs. So they started pouring these bags in front of me, which contained uh, 50 kilograms of coins. So with my friends, I started looking at them. So here are the, so at, I, I mean, uh, when they put about 10 bags like that, I said enough because I mean, I couldn't just, I mean, uh, study them. I tried to get a grasp of it, what it was. And these are the coins. So it had been bars, benchmark coins, Bactrian coins, and also Achaemenid coins, and then Indusitian coins, and early Kushan coins. It covers the history of seven centuries. And I wanted to go there. So I went with a team with Philip Flondra, who is a journalist. Uh, so in Kabul, um, I met the Minister of Cultural Affairs. He kindly gave me uh, 22 bodyguards because the region is extremely dangerous in Mirsaka. And this is the part we took to go there. And here is the Minister of um, Culture, uh, Cultural Affairs who gave me the permission to go there. And we went with Abdul Sakir, who was the assistant director, who was, I mean, this equivalent of ASI in India. He could, I mean, he could speak most of the languages. It was a blessing, you know, it, like in India, in, in Afghanistan, people talk different languages and different dialects. Uh, so these are my bodyguards on my way. And this is the place where the hoard was found. It was a well. In 42, the French, 1942, French archaeologists did a rapid excavation, but they had to stop. In 1992, the, the Mujahideens, started digging this place and they found about four tons of coins and 500, 300, sorry, 350 tons of coins and 500 kilograms, um, uh, sorry, 3.5 uh, 3, 3 tons of uh, coins and 500 kilograms of, uh, uh, of gold and silver objects. So this is the place where this was found, but they didn't go to the bottom of the well because so many people got killed and some people who Peasants, these are the peasants who went to the well, and some of the people, um, when they found gold, they just sallowed it and nipped to, um, to get it next day, but some died because of that. Excavation was stopped and it was completely illicit. So, my knowledge about it is not archaeological knowledge, but I learned by going there, by going to the Peshawar Bazaar, and also, uh, uh, I mean, talking to people, all these people that you see in the photographs, except the children, they were quite young, but this happened in 1992-93, they went, they went into the well. So I stayed night uh, in the village, it was minus 20, the temperature, and there were no heating system. So people, um, I, I can remember, I had a carpet on me, it was so cold when I slept. So people came with their coins and what they what they kept for them. So I started identifying them, all these objects. So I wrote one book, uh, the portrait of Alexander, uh, with these gold coins which was found there. And not, I mean, some accept it as genuine, others say it's a fake. But I have shown in this, um, it is a genuine coin. But you can read our arguments uh, to believe me or not. But I really because it was in my hand in the bag of fifty kilograms each of these coins. So if you look at the uh, the pattern of the hoards, it's a very interesting pattern. That's what I want to say. Some hoards are limited to Bactria. Some hoards are with three kings. Some are with about seven, uh, uh, seven to six kings, and sometimes with four kings. And this hoard had Sari Saleh hoard, the one that uh, bulldozer hit, and it had many coins, even up to asses. So this is a way of writing, one way of writing the history. The other way is looking at the monograms. Unfortunately, in the Greek world, the monograms help, uh, help you to uh, know the city, the main city. But in Bactria, people have made a lot of attempts to read them. So each coin has a monogram. So monogram is a motif made of overlapping or combining two or more letters to form one symbol. So I'll give you one example. So this symbol, if you can read all these letters here, that means you can read you can read nu, lambda, delta, alpha, iota, zeta. So the problem is which letter is the first? Now, if you want to read uh, Demet or Demet um, Demetria or something, it's a it's a very difficult task of uh, reading. And here, for example, this one has so many letters, 
and this so you can you can have eta like this you can have delta you can have lambda you can have iota you can have mu you can have p you can have phi you can have c you can have gamma tota all that in one one command but unfortunately they won't help us much to understand the city so it's a big problem but one thing that they can do is the greek successors they they monopolize some of the important greek means so you can see some continue to a certain extent and some were taken by now with the clear uh, uh, open to and um, and some were taken by strato so it's a it's a combination of uh, um, uh, work of how the monogram pattern works so we are able to give a pattern to these coins so here again is uh, the last kings like uh, Indusidian Maoris and Apollodotus. So it has a logical pattern of which I have worked a lot when, when writing the history. The other thing is the overstrikes. What I, what I mean by overstrike is instead of using a virgin flan to strike a coin, you can take a coin which is already struck, die struck. So instead of the virgin flan between the two punches, one is the reverse die, the other one is obverse die, you put the die, um, die struck coin and you give a hammer blow. And what will happen is the two new dice will come on the old one. And if you are sometimes it will cover completely the old coin or it may leave some traces. For example, this coin, I don't know whether you can immediately understand what is the uh, original coin and what are the dice of the overstruck, uh, the overstruck dice. So look at the coin now. Now, if you look at it, this is one part. So you have a bearded figure. And here you have a Nike, right? So this is, uh, this is one. That means that this is the, uh, the coin or the die of the person who overstruck the coin. And what he, who we see is uh, Gondofaris. You can see the beard and you can see Nike. So you need to have a complete knowledge of the coins which were in circulation during this period. And then you turn the coin, right? So the, the bearded part, now you turn the coin and you can see another face. And this is a face of uh, Hermias Posthumus. And here is the Nike, but here you can see somebody with a hand. So we see. So here you have the coin of Hermias Posthumus one, and the, and the legend, Basilius Soteros, and then you have Zeus seated. So it is an overstrike of um, uh, Gondofaris over a uh, posthumous issue of Hermias. So this is a way if, the, if Gondofaris overstruck the coin of Hermias, he has to be either a contemporary, if not a successor. He can't be a predecessor. So this is one of the ways of looking at the history. For example, here, Look at these coins, and you know you have a bearded figure. If you turn the coin like this, you have a helmeted figure. So it's a coin of um, uh, Heliocles overstruck on a coin of Agathocleia. And here you can see very clearly the bearded figure and the helmeted figure. So it's a very difficult exercise. Um, of uh, now those days when I published those overstrikes, we didn't have even the computer. So I have to look at with the with the loop with the magnifying glass. But today with the computer, you can do miracles. So you can enlarge it and see the overstrike. So my second article on the on the overstrikes, which was much better than the first one, because I can give a accurate uh, uh, depiction. So the the how the story about this Indo Greeks, uh, as I told you, uh, starts with the Alexander's conquest. Um, before, uh, uh, when Alexander conquered this area in, in India, in the Gangetic Valley, there were what we call the Mahajanapadas. You know about it. I'm not going to talk about it. So we know the Mahajanapada coins, the different series, as you know, different places, Kuru, Panchala, uh, Avanti, and other places. And in Gandhara, there were what we call the uh, Benbas. And those are the coins that Alexander Taxila uh, Taxil, the prince, uh, gave to Alexander to ask, ask him or asking him not to conquer his kingdom. So in 326, Alexander came to Taxila 
and then um, and after that he went to Hidabs after Taxila and had the battle with Porus. So here is a depiction where Alexander, I mean, after his victory, look in the nature of Alexander, he is crowned by uh, Nikias, and here you have on the neck of the elephant Porus attacking Alexander, and here is the Mahur trying to, um, I mean, hold the the, the 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 spear of Alexander or the Sarissa. But this never took place in the history. Alexander never conquered, never attacked Porus. Porus fell down from his horse. Uh, but the Greeks were no, I mean, you know, fake news. So it is a fake news of that period showing Alexander heroically attacking the Porus. No, Porus didn't uh, uh, lose the battle with the personal combat with Alexander, but as a result of the um, attack of the Greek army against the elephant, 250 elephants um, of Porus. So this is what we saw in most of the uh, cinema uh, of, of it and some of our really bad movies, but I'm not going to enter this. I have realized I have only another 20 minutes left, so I go very fast. So here you have um, uh, uh, the same thing on a, a coin on these coins where you can see the uh, Alexander attack in Porus. And then after after the uh, the the conquest of um, Porus kingdom, um, Alexander asked Porus how should I treat you? And he said, Porus said, treat me as a king. So uh, Alexander was very much impressed and uh, he gave his kingdom to him and started going down. The one what thing that we have to bear in mind is. Alexander conquered the world, and this was the known world of that time. Uh, there was no world beyond Indus for the Greeks. So Indus was the, the ultimate end of the flat world because the Greeks thought the world was flat. And after Indus was the no man's land where the sea fell from, uh, from each side. And then when he came to Indus, he realized that the world is not has not come to an end. Beyond that, there is another world. There are Indian kings who can even raise an army of 2,000 elephants instead of 250. He wanted to go. He was only 20, uh, uh, 30, 30 years old when he was there. But his generals like Ptolemy and Seleucus said, no, 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 we don't want to go. We want to go back. And he was wounded. And some say he got malaria, and some say, I mean, in the battle, in, uh, he was he was mortally wounded. So he uh, went down the Indus River and took this terrible road up to Babylon. So he died on June 10, 323. And after that, his kingdom, I mean, his generals like Seleucus, um, Antigon Gonatas, and also Ptolemy, they fought. And the his kingdom, the big kingdom was separated into many places, but it's in this color is what Seleucus was, the founder of the Seleucid Empire, got under his control, and the Egypt, um, 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 the area of um, Egypt went to Ptolemy, and then there were fights with uh, Antigon Gonatas and others, and Lysimachus. So logically, the area south of the Hindukush mountains should be under his control, but since he was very much involved with the fight uh, with the, his other generals, he didn't know what happened here. So by that time, Chandragupta founded his empire and came up to the Hindu Kush mountains. So this is what I said, this was a natural frontier. So when he came in um, much later, um, um, and he realized in 306 that he is not able to conquer the uh, those territories of the Indus. So instead, what he did was he made, made an agreement, promised his one of his daughters in marriage to Chandragupta, and took 500 elephants, four elephants, and went back. <clears throat> so he to use as weapon. So this was the official recognition by the Seleucids uh, of the existence of the Myron Empire uh, in 305. The Myrans has the legal uh, authority of the territories of India, uh, south of the Hindu Kush mountains. After him, um, I mean, Antiochus I, his son became the king and he was ruling in Bactria and he issued uh, coins in Bactria. And also Antiochus II uh, and, uh, became the king of Bactria. And during this time, um, um, of course, Chandragupta Maurya came to power and you know, um, after him, uh, Bindusara and then and Ashoka. Um, so um, Chandragupta, um, Ashoka, 
empire was one of the biggest um, ever before the British Empire in uh, India, and so and also the conversion of uh, uh, conversion of um, um, Ashoka into Buddhism made a huge difference in Indian history uh, because it uh, um, it removed all the taboos of navigation. So the uh, the traders of North India started going to Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. It is economically wonderful achievement. And also we have heard about these bilingual inscriptions, um, Aramaic and Greek from Kandahar. And this is the text. I'm not going to read it. Uh, I will leave it to you because time is really running uh, very badly. So this is the translation of that inscription and also the other inscriptions written in Brahmi, in Aramaic, in Greek and in Karoshti. During that time, Ashokan period, Ashoka issued these Myron coins uh, which are very, very important, and they were in circulation all over the empire. And um, so uh, what you call the Panchmark coins, um, and we, we know they were the name of these coins in Kanagandhali excavation, this was found, and they are very clear, say, these are Kapani. So this is the word in Pali, which is called Kapana, and also in Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit Krakchapana. And also in the uh, treasury of Icanum, this inscription was found, and it is um, a paraphilisco uh, uh, um, uh, kashapana taksena. That means the kashapana or kahapana from taksila. So this is quite important. These are the punchmark coins which were issued in taksila, found um, in the treasury, which um, which had ten thousand coins. You can imagine the amount of the production of these coins. So recently, as I told you, I published this whole, I mean, this hoard and many other hoards found, found in Pakistan and uh, in Afghanistan, uh, combined with my colleague uh, from the Kolkata Museum, Sushmita Basumachunda, and you can give a, and it gives a very clear idea about the Panchmark coins and how to uh, identify them. And these are from the publication. You have the common symbols like sun and the six month uh, symbol and then the colleen and then the other, other symbols differ. Um, so here again, um, how they are, these are all punched, not die struck. Again, another one. Since I am giving the PowerPoint, you can have a look at them leisurely. So the, as I told you, the Bactrian kingdom was started by Diodotus in 250. So we have plenty of evidence for that. So uh, when Sri asked me several book, I wrote several books on the question. The first one was written by in French, which was published by the Bibliothèque Nationale, the National Library, which is still used the chronology that I proposed. And later I published many collections. One is the American Numismatic Society in New York. And then I published this coin hoard with the, uh, in Bara from Pakistan and also the ancient Indian coins, which I republished, which published with Wilfred Pieper by Brepols. And then the, the, my collected works, um, all the, it's published by Manohar in New Delhi, uh, all my important articles, not all of them. And uh, along with the ones published in French, I trans I mean, they are all translated into English. And the, my recent, recent book on Gandhara and art, where I rediscuss the chronology of the Indo Greeks, Indo Scythian Kushans, altogether. So we have a summary left by uh, uh, by Trope Pompey or Pompeo Strobus, uh, which is called Historia Philippicae, which is the universal history, where he says that uh, that Diatotus, a satrap of Seleucids, um, uh, revolted against the Seleucid Empire and became independent and he took his name. So he says Basileus Diodotu. So this is in genetic case. Basileus means of the king Diodotus, that means he became an independent king. If you issue gold coins, that means you are really independent. Uh, this coin is important, why there is a special mark. This coin was found in um, in Vaishali, uh, in the middle Gangetic Valley. Uh, it was issued by Diodotus, not that he ruled in Vaishali, but these coins were taken for bullion value, gold value for the trade. And traders wanted to see whether they were they are not fakes or they were not plated. So you give a chisel mark, you see the same thing with the Roman coins. It's not to dis defigure, uh, disfigure the portrait, but to check the gold quantity. So he had a son called Diodotus II, and then for, we learned from Polybus um, um, that he uh, uh, 
uh, a person, a king called Euthydemus. Um, uh, Euthydemus um, uh, killed the success of Diodorus and became the king. Uh, and this happened during the time of Antiochus III. Antiochus III, who wanted to reconquer the lost Bactria, uh, came and made a siege uh, around Bactra, but he gave it up and said, okay, you can rule now. So he left because he was more interested in other things. And then he was succeeded by his son called Demetrius. So we have plenty of evidence for that, not only literary, but also epigraphical evidence. Since he was the king like Alexander, who crossed the Hindukush mountains and came to India, um, and um, after the decline of the Mauryan Empire, he wears an ele uh, elephant scalp, elephant symbolized in India. So it's a very interesting thing. And also we have the uh, Plutarch's evidence saying that Demetrius was the son, and this inscription was found uh, quite recently in Tajikistan, which was published by Paul Bernard and Rushmore. And it's very clearly says here, Megistion uh, Nitudemon Basileon, Kalinikon Demetrion, meaning that the Demetrius, the son of Euthydemus, the king, and by this time, uh, Euthydemus was the king and he is the son, and he is Megastion, he is Megas, he is great. So we have this evidence to say that Demetrius was the successor of Euthydemus. And then we have plenty of other coins. We don't know their names in um, any, any other text or any epigraphical evidence like Euthydemus II. I mean, you can see every time the reason why you say there were 45 kings because we can read their names. Here you have Leo Suchidemu and he has Heracles uh, holding the, um, the lion's king of Neme and the, and the club and also uh, we are in the crown. So the, these Greek kings who, um, I'm sorry, Shriya, if you could be half an hour, uh, sorry, another 10 minutes, I'll try to go very quickly. The north of the Hindukush mountains, there were monolingual coins, only with Greek legend, and the southern Hindukush mountains, because we are India, where the Gandhari was spoken, and the same Greek rulers issued bilingual coinage. So if you look at it, it's very clear, it says Basileo Situdemu, and they were struck in the attic weight. So it's 16.8 grams. And the bilingual coins, they have bilingual legends. So you have here Basilios Soteros Niku. And if you read, this is in Karoshti. Karoshti, not like Brahmi, you read from right to left. So here you have Maharajasa, Trasarasa, Nikyasa. So these are so any bilingual coin that you find, they were issued in India. Any monolingual coin, they were issued in Batra. So this is except few exceptions. So these are some of the monolingual coins like Euthydemus, Avatocles, Pontalian. And what is interesting is Avatocles had monolingual coinage, which is uh, name, and the depictions of the first depictions of Balaram, Samkarshan, and Vasudeva, um, they were found in the treasury of Aikanum um, um, uh, in a pouch of a traveler. Uh, so here you have the legend uh, in Greek, and here you have the legend in Brahmi. It's very rare you get Brahmi. Normally, it's, of course, the legend is in Gandh uh, Gandhari language, but the, the, the Aksharas are Brahmi. On the other coins, Aksharas are of Karoshti. So here we have very clearly two Indian divinities. They are all Vishnu cult. One is Samkarshana Balarama because he has got the hala, the plough, and also the musala, which is the pistol. So we are sure it is um, some Vasudeva and um, uh, some Karshan. And then on the Indusidian coins too, we have got the Balarama. And then on the other side, we have Krishna Vasudeva um, holding the chakra and also the conch, um, conch shell or the Sankha, which was misunderstood by the French archaeologists, which is really a bad interpretation of the conch. And also, this was misunderstood by my teacher. Uh, he thought this is a headdress. No, it is not a headdress, but it is a chatra over the head. Uh, the Greek, um, Greek uh, engraver misunderstood. So, and also the cult of uh, um, uh, Gajalakshmi, like in Bharut and Sanchi, and also later in Asilis's coin, and also in Demetrius' coin, you find uh, these Hindu ghosts, which is like Lakshmi, it's very important. But 
these codes first appeared on the Pachmal coin, which was a study by Wilfred people. You can see Balarama Ram Samkarshana holding the chakra um, and the uh, and the uh, uh, and the danda, and also the, on the other side the the plow. So we are sure that they were there were Vishnu Vishnu cult um, in India uh, during the Mayan period. So here we are. Uh, it's very important evidence when you look at the iconography. So here we have the most, I mean, evocative depiction of Balaram, Samkarshana and Vasudeva Krishna. And also it is very important if you go to Vidisha, the, the inscription um, by Heliodorus, of the, which is of the Bhagavata cult, uh, referring to, uh, to the Greek ambassador uh, sent by Agdi Akhidas from Taxila. Um, uh, uh, and who says that he was adept of the uh, Bhagavata cult. So this is another important evidence. And then we have commemorative coins like Agathocles and uh, um, Antimachus commemorating the kings who ruled before them. So Alexander the Great. And then we have the king, uh, kings like Diodotus and Euthydemus and Demetrius and also Pentaleon. So that means all these kings, if they are commemorated, they ruled before and also Antimachus, and also, as I told you, the Yusufdara parchment is very important for his dating. So we can date him between 185 and 170. Um, they are, we are in a Kosia, that means it is the Kovra chef of the headdress of the Macedonian army, like in Macedonia. Like many other kings, they also are depicted just to show their relationship with Alexander here. And all the Greek goddesses here, we have Athena seated. And then time to time you get uh, Indian, you have Indian elephant and you have a zebu. Uh, you know, elephant, uh, this is of course the um, Elephas Maximus, the Indian elephant, not the African one. And uh, on the reverse, you have a zebu, uh, the, uh, or the Bostorus Hindukus, and they use this. Apart from that, just to show that these are first bilingual coins, uh, to show that they are respecting to a certain extent the coins which are in circulation. So you have the sun symbol, six arm symbol, hill with the um, uh, with the star and the river symbol, and on the on the rivers you have a Nandi Varta, the face of the Nandi. Right? These are the symbols that normally you find in Panchmark coins like here. And then this is the biggest uh, gold coins uh, ever struck uh, in antiquity, which is of. Uh, uh, um, Euclides, which can be dated around 170 BC, um, uh, which uh, weight is 160 and almost 170 grams, found in Uzbekistan. It's a very long story. If you are, I mean, if you want to know more about it, I will tell you. The important thing is that the first the legend was engraved this way, and later they decided to engrave it in this way. And from this moment onwards, all the coins struck in um, Bactria and India had this semicircular form. And these are the sons of Zeus, Dioscuri, Castor and Pollux. And here is the portrait of, beautiful portrait of Euclides, um, uh, who was killed by his son. Um, and then copying from the Seleucid portraits. And then you have this wonderful, uh, portraits, you know, the king seen from the back and throw in the javelin, and also the king commemorating his father and son, in, father and mother, Heliocles and Laodicus, um, following the Ptolemaic tradition, and also having women on coins like Agathocleia, who would have been the mother of Strato. So you have first Agathocleia um, 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 alone, and then Agathocleia with her son, like this, and also the same tradition. Uh, here the husband and wife, Hermaios and Calliope. So the women were depicted on the coins of these. And then here is a peridot, a uh, ring that I published recently, where you have the same type of uh, dual portraits. The women were represented. Here we have an Amazon, a woman riding a horse. You can see from the breast, it's really a woman. Um, so uh, by 130, uh, the Bactrian kingdom collapsed, but the Indo Greeks continued for a long time again. And this area was conquered, Bactria was conquered north of the Indo Kush by the UHE, who became the Kushans later. And Indo Greek kingdom continued. And the most important king was Menander, 
uh, who is mentioned in the, uh, the in the Greek and Latin sources and also in the Melinda Panya. So he has got the bilingual coinage um, uh, here and also the monolingual coinage, which is very important, where you can see Athena uh, throwing the thunderbolt, having the, uh, the shield um, decorated by the Gorgon head, the Medusa's head. And this is something that you can see in Gandhara Nath. So there are plenty of other, other coins like this uh, by his successors like Nisia, Strato, Apollodotus, Epanda. They all follow the Athena Alcidemus, who was the patron goddess of Pella, where Alexander was born. What they try to do is they try to show they are the real descendants of Alexander by using his headdresses or like the elephant scalp or the cosia, and also using the goat of the, um, in favor of Alexander, like Athena Alcidemus, until the last two kings, like Strato the second and the third, and some beautiful coins. This was found in Mirsaka, uh, where, uh, which is still a unique coin, where you can see Menander seen from the back. And this is the, uh, the ages uh, with the head of Medusa. You can see a snake coming out of it. So as you know, the the Medusa hair instead of the hair here, she had snakes on it. And you can see this was followed by Philoxenus, and Diocles, and Alcidas. And here, look at this one. It's very clear. You have the Medusa set. So I turned the coin with the Photoshop, and you can see Medusa set with the snakes coming out like here. So iconography is absolutely beautiful and, and very precise uh, uh, in their following. And also, since they are in India, they really want to be smart. And instead of the ages, they put a four part of an elephant, a tusker, to say that we have conquered India, and they put their elephant on it. And also the symbol of elephant here, it's a coin of Antiochus with his portrait, um, and it's Basilios Nikaphori of Antiochus, self-seated holding uh, Nike, and elephant uh, venerating the Zeus. You know, this is the way how the elephants do, as you know, and also showing Antiochus, the same person whose ambassador went to Vidisha, uh, seated, uh, standing in front of the elephant, which is a symbol of India. The Heliocles was the last king to rule in Bactria. And the, these are the successors of uh, Menander uh, in the Indian territories. And curiously, these are the kings who issued the largest gold denomination and the largest silver denomination in the whole world of that period. And this, is also, this was found in the treasure, Kunduz treasure, uh, treasure um, uh, hoard. Uh, which is the weight of um, 80, nearly 85 grams, which shows the helmeted portrait of Antium and um, um, uh, Amintas with Zeus uh, on the reverse hole in Nike. So uh, the story ends the Indo Greek kingdom, even though the portraits of the very last Indo Greek sovereigns, such as Apollophani, Strato II, and third, have a grotesque aspect, certainly because of the absence of experience engravers in a period of political decadence. Their attachment to the Hellenistic tradition continues to be manifest in the symbolic reverse type. So these are the last kings of Indo Greek kingdom. So next week, I'll tell you what happened after the disappearance of the Indo Greek kings with the Indo Scythians, Indo Parthians, and the, and the Kushans. Uh, so uh, then, to, I mean, next week about the invasion of UHE, Indo Greeks, and then the Indo Scythians and the Indo Parthians.